Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks, to the 10 o'clock hour of the Rock Newman Show from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets. I am absolutely flattered uh, to have as my guest this hour a lady who is an African-American economist, an author, liberal and social and political commentator. I have so enjoyed seeing her commentating on shows across the spectrum, whether it's ABC, CBS, NBC, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever it might be, giving folks fits. <laughs> <laughs> she's a businesswoman, and she's president emeritus of Bennett College. She was uh, spent five years there heading up that historically black college Dr. Suzanne Mal uh, Julianne yeah. Malvo. <laughs> yes. uh, Suzanne Malvo is with CNN. And she's my uh, cousin. <laughs> Julianne and what? And she's my cousin. And she is your cousin, yes. Um, she asked me to do that. Did she? <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, welcome to the Rock Newman Show. Good to be here. It's Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. My Lord, we could start so many places, but I had heard rumor lately that a few weeks ago, you were in Cuba. Absolutely. And before that, somebody named Beyonce and Jay-Z was there, and there was such a storm. T please tell us about your Cuba trip. How is Cuba these days? What? Please give us reflections. Well, first, I'm going to make you laugh. We had the same tour guide that Beyonce and Jay-Z had. <laughs> really? So, yeah. So they were saying how they were mobbed everywhere they went, and... You know, all of that. We weren't mobbed, of course. But uh, <laughs> Cuba is an interesting place. Um, Raul Castro has said he won't run for re-election. That means that he'll be out probably in 2017. So they're sitting there on the cusp of becoming world citizens um, in, from the perspective of the possibility that the U.S. might lift the embargo, that a younger person might be more able to negotiate with the United States, you know, Fidel Castro, of course, is almost persona non grata here in the United States. And it's really not the whole United States. One of the things we learned is that Florida, you know, Florida is so important politically in presidential elections that nobody wants to lift this embargo on Cuba, which is crazy. Because the, having the embargo makes it very difficult for people to live. You know what? Can we do just something really basic? And I think that you're a person that is eminently qualified to... To, to, to answer this stuff. <laughs> the, we have had an embargo against Cuba since in the 62. Early, well, then lifted, then taken back down, um, early 80s. Right, okay, now. But not only our embargo, as, as the Soviet Union started having more economic problems, the Soviet Union was a primary source, not only of money because yeah. of sugar, mm -hmm. but also of outside goods. Yes. So now they have no source. Okay, so. Our reason, the U.S.'s reason for treating Cuba as a horrible stepchild mm -hmm. is what? Bay of Pigs. Uh, President Kennedy, 1961. Um, Cuba was then going through its transition from uh, Batista yes. to Castro. Batista was um, turned Cuba into the playground for the wealthy. Yes. So and with all the poor people sort of waiting on the wealthy and, you know, just really a playland. When um, Bastista was run out by um, Che Guevara and Fidel Castro, there were transitions going on. The U.S. threatened. We supported um, Bastista, not, not Castro. The U.S. threatened um, basically military action. Cubans fought back. Yeah. And so really, we treat them like a stepchild because they had the nerve the temerity to fight back the big bad United and, and, States. And, and, and U.S. policy mm -hmm. has been, and, 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 and sort of what you hear from the lips yes. of politicians, is we, we handle Cuba this way. The primary reason they give is human rights violations. Please. That's the primary. That, that's, that's okay, the pri but we deal with China. Hello. <laughs> and that's exactly a straight line where I'm, where I'm going. And so... However you twist and turn U.S. policy, when you have engage, full, full, mm -hmm. full engagement with China, trade and the rest. Exactly. And you look at their obvious, overt, transparent 
human rights <laughs> yes. violations. And then you say the reason you don't deal with Cuba is human rights violations. That is political hypocrisy at its absolute best. You know, the late Ron Walters wrote about something called foreign policy justice. And what he wrote about was the extent to which you had to treat countries with some equivalency. In other words, if human rights violations are the deal breaker, then anyone who has human rights violations ought to have problems. But the problem with that is we have human rights violations. Um, Trayvon Martin had no human rights. That's a violation. The man wasn't even arrested until, you know, almost a month later. We can go down the list and talk about human rights violations. Spencer Overton was just with you doing great work on the Voter right, Voting Rights Act as well as on those people who are, yeah, these are human rights violations to tell people they can't vote. Or the brother in Shelby County, one black person on the county commission, and they gerrymandered or hit him out of his seat. That's a human rights violation. So we do not have, we should not lecture anybody about human rights violations. We have dealt with Vietnam. Vietnam essentially whipped our behinds and was not afraid of the big bad United States. But now we're trading with Vietnam. So why not Cuba? And you know, the Monroe Doctrine, Rock, was asserted in 1812, which said that the United States would manage or would intervene in the North, North America, which would include Cuba, it would include Haiti. However, when you look at these people of color, Haiti, who had the nerve to whip France, and so that's why we treat Haiti peripherally. Cuba, same thing. You had these revolutionaries who got rid of a U.S. puppet. And that's really, at the end of the day, the, what the issue is. You know, boy, we're really going to jump around here. Uh, there's, okay. a, there's, a, there's a lot to talk about. When you talk about puppets, mm -hmm. someone who wasn't a puppet, was a guy referred to as a madman, dictator, Muammar Gaddafi. Yes. Muammar Gaddafi was attempting to establish uh, a very strong African coalition mm -hmm. and have a currency with the resources that are underfoot on the continent of Africa. His position was is that we can develop our own currency and, 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 and become a self-sufficient continent mm -hmm. to, to compete with the rest of the world unlike we've ever done before. He was taken out a variety of reasons given. What are, you, what are your thoughts on you know, something not, just not, so, not so far ago history as to what happened uh, and, and how this country and the rest of the diplomatic corps around the, the world were involved in his ouster and ultimately, you know, him being dragged through the streets. Yes. Can, can, can you give us your thoughts on that? Well, you know, the United States, look at what happened to uh, Patrice Lumumba. You know, that man was assassinated by the United States because he was revolutionary. So we have had a habit of covertly taking people out. We've done it, the Europeans have done it, when people do not play the game. And that's really what it's about, playing the game. There is no African or Arab uh, country that sits on the G8, which makes economic policy for the world. So if they added Russia, it used to be the G7, they added Russia, but with the size of Africa, and with the oil producing that comes out of the Arab world, why do these countries not have a seat on the G8? Because it is a narrow, white, with a little Asian occasion. It's a narrow occasion of essentially white people who still believe that they can run the world. You know, we jumped in here. We just jumped right. We just jumped in, jumped in with world affairs. Let's learn a little bit about Julianne Malvo in this five minutes of this first section here. Julianne, where did you grow up? Give us, give us some history here. I mean, there's some stuff that I'm probably going to tell before you tell it, like you're going to college at 16 years old, and you're getting your undergraduate degree if I if my research is correct. If it's not, I'm going to blame my researcher. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you go into college at 16 and getting your undergraduate degree and master's degree in a total of three years, mm -hmm. you know, as someone who barely graduated, not summa magna cum, but oh, thank good you. God, thank you, Lordy. <laughs> you got an undergraduate and master's degree in three years. Tell us about where you grew up and uh, how all that happened. Well, I'm a native San Franciscan. Grew up in San Francisco in the middle of, uh, I was a baby panther. 
So in the middle of all that heyday, and uh, people often ask me why I remain, you know, so left of center, and I'm like, that's, you know, San Francisco would do it. Um, I'm not, I'm a high school put out. Not drop out, but put out. You got put out of high school? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> You see, what had happened was... What had happened? <laughs> I had heard. <laughs> no, I was always in some form of trouble. I had great grades, but I was always in some form of trouble, talking back to teachers, all that. In fact, my mom sent me down to Mississippi for a year, uh, figuring that that was, quote, straighten me out. We had an aunt, we called her the kid breaker. I mean, she just whip you in the morning, cuz. Just because. Just because, you know, she's like, you're going to mess up sometime today, so let me whip you now. <laughs> get, it out the, get out the way early in the morning. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, Auntie Anime and I, I was always back talking to her. She caught me in a club called the Kickoff Club at 15. It was owned by an ex NFL player from Moss Point, Mississippi. So I was in the Kickoff Club at a bar stool drinking ginger ale. I mean, I wasn't drinking anything. Auntie came and grabbed not, me. And, not gin, but no, ginger ale. Ginger ale. Okay. She grabbed me by the back of my neck, and she was a little short, fat lady, uh-huh. and literally ran me home. <laughs> <laughs> literally ran me home. And then she, uh, I'm going to have a heart attack. And I said, I just kept running. I, I figured that was a trick. Uh-huh. <laughs> but anyway, from there, went to Boston College undergrad, which was a great experience for me. Learned a lot. Uh, uh, vice chair of the Black Student Union, uh, very involved in all kind of politics in Boston, and this was during the Louise Day Hicks days. Louise Day Hicks was a seven chin white woman who was on the school board. She had about seven chins, and she was, she said over her dead body, (laughs) over her dead body would black people go to school with white people. Yeah. We were like, well, give me what I really want. I mean, if you just want to offer your dead body, I'm cool with that, (laughs) (laughs) you know. But she, um, we were all active around that, you know, and, and had, a, had a great time with that. Went over to MIT and... Well, uh, you know what? Before you go there, before, let's back up just a little bit. San Francisco, come through college, you put out... I mean, you, yeah. did you graduate from high school? No. You did not. Well, what you could do... And my dad was an assistant superintendent of schools. So you could actually submit your grades uh-huh. if you went to college early to get your high school diploma. But then you had to learn how to swim. And this is when I had all this hair. And so, you know, the sisters will understand, if you have a lot of hair, you can't learn how to swim. Uh, this is not going to turn out right. I mean, even when I had a big old fro, you couldn't have all that peroxide and stuff in your hair. So when I went to turn my grades in, they said, well, you have to pass a swimming test. I'm like, that's all right. And so my mother would always say to me, you know, you better get your degree, because otherwise you're going to have to go work at the post office. You know, that's what they threaten black people with. You will go work at the post office. I'm, like, I'm cool with that, too. You know what? Um, this segment has gone so extraordinarily fast. What, the reason why I stopped you before you went too far into going into finishing at Boston and going to MIT is because I want to talk about, you grew up in San Francisco, you say he was a baby panther. I want to get some of your reflections on somebody named Huey P. Newton. Oh, my. Oh, my. When we return after these brief messages. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant Markdown Madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the Markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. Welcome back to the Rock Newman Show. My guest this hour, Dr. Julianne Malveaux. Uh, Dr. Malveaux informed us uh, in our first segment that uh, she grew up in San Francisco and referred to herself as a baby panther, and she's been getting in trouble ever since. Um, (laughs) um, Before the break, uh, I wanted to ask you about your reflections on Huey Newton. Okay. You know, it's interesting... One of my favorite stories about Huey Pete Newton is May 1st, 1969. We had a free Huey rally. And um, 
literally the streets of San Francisco outside City Hall were totally crowded. Uh, you, you, I mean, you literally could not walk down the street. There were so many of us out there. Now, that morning, my mom said to me, I know my children are going to school today. That's my brother and I. And we said, yes, ma'am. But this was pre-computer. So these days, you can't cut school like you used to be able to. These, these, those days, you go in a homeroom, and you were cool. Yeah. Now they follow you all day long, uh, invasion of privacy. <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, so we went to homeroom, and then we cooked up at the uh, subway station, not the subway, the trolley station, because uh, my brother was in junior high, I was in high school, and we went down to the Free Huey Rally. Now, um, your friend here, that would be me, had on a plaid mini, mini skirt and this humongous afro. So my mom, we were watching uh, TV at dinner, my mom said, uh, I know my children did not go to the Free Huey Rally. No, ma'am, we didn't go. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, you mm -hmm. see this afro. I said, Mommy, everybody has an afro that's like right. that. That's right. You know, everybody has a big afro. So then you get the side picture. You said, Julian, that sure looks like you. I said, a lot of people look like me. Yeah. You know, light skin, big afro. You yeah. know, could be Angela Davis. That's right. You know? Sure could so, be. So, you know, th the third news segment had me full face with my finger up at a policeman. She said, tell me that's not you. I said, I guess it you, is. <laughs> you were giving, giving the policeman the one finger salute? Yes. Really? Uh, yes. I mean, that was my constitutional right for free speech, <laughs> you know. And then when Huey did get out, he walked down Fillmore Street. I don't know what they did to that brother in jail, though. He walked down Fillmore Street and took his shirt off, and, you know, it was raining, and it was almost like a megalomaniacal moment. But everybody, again, was there. We had all turned out. You know, the Black Panther Party really was a brilliant invention uh, because it basically gave us audacity. I mean, you first of all had these brothers with guns. Now the guns were not loaded, mm -hmm. but they went to Sacramento, and the Oakland Tribune actually was owned by a real big, if you want to use the word cracker, as being used lately, big old cracker. And he put a picture of a gun pointed at, so if you read the paper, there was a picture of a gun pointed at you. So this was designed to scare people. Right. This, but the guns were empty, and they were really talking about the right to bear arms. The free breakfast program in the morning. We had so much poverty in Oakland and so many young people going to school and not eating. We didn't have all those, uh, what they do now where they feed you at lunchtime. So the Black Panther Party was doing that. The number one line on the 10-point program, and I'll never forget, we want freedom. We want the power to determine our destiny. So this was something that we're still f fighting for. Do me, a, do me a favor. Repeat that. We want freedom. We want the power to determine our destiny. And that was number one in the 10-point program. You know... Now, I don't remember all the rest of it, but that wouldn't... No, 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 <laughs> just, 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 just that there, you know, I, I've had, I, I, I had Minister uh, Farrakhan mm -hmm. on the show a few weeks back, and my premise was that he's been perhaps singularly the most vilified African American in the country over the last several decades, yes. and that at the core of what I think that he has attempted to promulgate is equality. Precisely. And equality is a very, very threatening yes, concept to those that are in power. You know, and the minister is the only person in these United States that the Congress has censured. Censured, censured and rebuked. And, and yeah. sat there and argued for nearly a day <laughs> about how dangerous minister Louis Farrakhan is. I mean, that's insanity. You've got uh, David Duke. You've got all kinds of... Uh, Timothy McVeigh. Yep. And Timothy nobody McVeigh. has taken a vote saying, you know, they're censured, but they censured Minister Farrakhan. And again, I think that uh, black freedom is threatening to some people. It's like uh, what's happening, one of my uh, colleagues, brother Walter Kimbrough, bad brother, he's uh, president of Dillard. And before that, he was president of Philander Smith College. Mm -hmm. And... I just did a piece for Essence about HBCUs. It will be in the August issue. And I called Kimbrough to get some quotes, and he said, the reason why people are attacking black colleges is because there's a fear of a black planet. Now, this is coming out of a black man's mouth who's the president of Dillard University. He said there's, there's a fear of black people, a fear of black intelligence, a fear, quite frankly, of us having these institutions of our own, which, despite the fact that we're all underfunded, we still have a black space. As I used to say at Bennett, you know, you will be challenged to do your best. There will not be professors ignoring you. Yeah. Whereas I had a student, um, not a, one of my students, a young lady who was at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She calls me up. She's majoring in econ. She has no mentor 
at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. No one has taken her under their wing. Right. So I come to the state, she calls me, I want to be an economist, can I come see you? And I'm like, sure, but there are all these people at Chapel Hill. She said, well, I, I just haven't connected with anybody. You're a senior and you haven't connected with anybody? Right. Now, you know, we were on them almost daily. You're a senior, make sure you have your recommendations lined up, right. do this, do that, do the other. Um, you could make it at a majority college. I went to Boston College and MIT. But I would be a much nicer person had I gone to an HBC. <laughs> <laughs> because cause at some of these schools, you have to fight for everything yeah. you get. I mean, yeah. you, you go in there with your yeah. fist balled up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My freshman year at Boston College. Or if you don't go in with your fist balled up, you leave out with it balled up. Right? Which I, I, was, I went to college early. But I had gone to a very competitive high school in San Francisco. So some of the stuff they were reading in college, I had already read. And again, my memory is weird, but there's a story called The Garden Party, which is about class in England. So the little teacher, she was an ABD at, at uh, Harvard, assigned a story. I wrote about it. She accused me of not having done my own work. Now, excuse me, but I was a published writer when I was 15 years old in The Black Scholar. I have poetry published when I was third, published when I was 13 years old. So I'm thinking, how dare you accuse me of cheating? Um, we, we, we made it all the way to the dean. My mother wrote a two-page letter. I mean, people think I'm crazy. They should meet my mom. I mean, she doesn't have, she doesn't have a speck of sense. <laughs> and if you, if you try her, she will go off on you. So she wrote a two-page letter to the school saying, I did not send my child there to be bothered. You know, she's written, she da da da. Anyway, the dean um, got involved, and the woman was insistent that I had cheated. Everybody, you know, the few black folks in the class are like, she didn't cheat. She doesn't need to cheat. So the dean said, I'm going to give you a test. I said, what's that? He said, I will lock you in my office for an hour. He said, write about anything you want to write about. So I went in there and I wrote a thousand words about why people should not have pets. Um, that just came to me because, you know, certain people, melanin deprived people, will purchase um, Sweaters, cashmere sweaters for their dogs, you know, the shoes for their dogs. I'm surprised I haven't seen dogs with gold earrings on. But, you know, meanwhile, these are not the people who want to give our children, poor children, hungry children, anything. So I wrote all that down. The dean said, no, you didn't cheat. You know, he's like, yeah. he's like, no, you didn't cheat. And that lady was not back at Boston College the next semester. They let her finish the semester, but, you know, and we, we had her terrorized. Good we you. truly had her afraid of black folks on campus. Good for you. Let's go back to a uh, 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 conversation in, in, in your uh, knowledge of the president of Dillard College. Something happened in the news recently. Okay. Dr. Dre donated mm -hmm. $25 million, I think the number was, mm -hmm. to the uh, University of Southern California. Yep. And the Dillard president um, came out mm -hmm. with some words that said that, hey, you know, we've got these black colleges you that know? are suffering and you're donating your money there. And of course, there's the premise that Dr. J has worked hard. He's earned his dollars. You know, he should be able to spend his dollars any way he wants to. There are those, there are others that say, hey, you know, your support came from the, commu from the African American community. And, and this is where your initial support and how you got on the map was because of, of the community that supported you. So if you're going to give some money, why didn't you give there? How do you feel about that? I agree. I mean, Kimbrough, we call him hip hop because he's the youngest of the black college presidents. He mm -hmm. started uh, presidenting when he was probably in his late 30s. He's 46 now, right. mid 30s, actually. Um, so we call him hip hop because he's the, the youngest kid on the block mm -hmm. and he does not mince words. Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely right. I mean, with the affirmative action decision, number one, and with so many states making rules about who can go to their schools, number two, People are going to need historically black colleges and universities. Yeah, more I than mean, ever. This admission cycle, I think I've had to pick up the phone, which I, I don't mind doing because it's what I do, and get like half a dozen kids into HBCUs. Now, some of these were not 4.0 students, but right. guess what? They will be. Right. They will be if they're in the right environment. Because some of our inner city high schools harass our kids. I mean, my first semester at Bennett, of course, my mouth would get me in trouble. I was on somebody's TV show. I said, I could turn anybody into a scholar anybody. Now, some brother in Richmond, Virginia, brought me a truck full of students. <laughs> he said, okay, here you go. So, you know, most of them were young sisters who, you know, they were B students, maybe B minus, no prob. But there was one young lady who had a 1.9 GPA. Not good. Not good. She couldn't even play on the basketball team. And so I said to her, I said, tell me what you've been doing. Because my admissions people were always mad, but I said, let's take a chance, let's take a chance. And they were like, look, 
Doc, you can't take with so many chances. I said, tell me what you could have been doing to get a 1.9 GPA. Right. That's just like for going to school, and that's all. So she said, you know, her dad had died. She just had a lot of emotional problems. Her mother remarried very quickly. So she said she basically showed her hind parts um, for about two years. Mm -hmm. She was angry with her mother. She was angry with the stepfather. But then she decided to get her act together, and a chemistry teacher was sexually harassing the students. So she didn't go to class. Wow. And, um, and he flunked her both semesters. Now, that's not the only flunk she had. But mm -hmm. So I told her, I said, I'm going to give you a chance. I said, but let me say something to you. I said, my rep is on the line. I said, my admissions people, you know, even though I'm their boss, they mess up with me all the time. How come you, where do you find these students from? <laughs> you know? yeah. And um, so anyway, that girl graduated with a 3.6 GPA. Hello. You know, and admitted to two, um, including Duke, and to two prestigious graduate schools. Mm -hmm. So we just have to give them a chance. So many people have told our kids, you can't. You have some of these teachers who really, quite frankly, should not be teaching. You know, they should, you know, Michelle Reed doesn't have any sense. And I don't know how she's on the national scene at all, you know, talking about our kids. But the only thing I would agree with her on is there are some teachers who may need to take a break. Mm -hmm. They don't need to be out of the classroom. They may need to take a break. I believe that teachers should get sabbaticals just like professors do after seven years. Right. Why? Because if you're in some schools, those children are something else, you know? And... Uh, a lot of times you don't have parental intervention. When parents are young, if you had a child at 16, you're not 40. When you're, you know, when you're young people are sure. in high school, you're, sure. you're, you may be, you know, 30, right. given some of these, you know, teen pregnancy rates. Mm -hmm. So you don't know how to negotiate the system. You didn't negotiate it for yourself. Right. And, you know, this stuff can wear you out. Uh, Julianne, you confidently, nonchalantly, but confidently said, you know, I can turn any kid into a scholar. Mm -hmm. How? First of all, attention. A lot of our young people need attention. Secondly, remediation. If you come out of, of, of uh, high school and you have some reading challenges or math challenges, there's such a thing as remediation. If you believe that the young person can learn, they will. Now, they may not learn on your schedule or mine. Mm -hmm. It might take them six years to get out of undergraduate school as opposed to four. It's with our brothers especially, you might find somebody who says they've got to sit out for a year or two. Or they may need to earn money. I had one lady from Washington, D.C., older sister, who had returned to college. Well, she would come every fall, and then every spring she would earn money so that she could pay her tuition. So literally, she would come to school in the fall and do well, but she didn't have any money. And when you see what's happening with student financial aid, within in about four days, Rock, the interest rate on student loans is going to oh, double. No. Yeah. Uh, the Parent PLUS loan has made it very difficult for parents to get involved in loaning, borrowing money for their child's education. Uh, they've changed the requirements. It used to be that they dealt with your credit score. Now, if you've missed the payment, you're ineligible for Parent PLUS. Now, when people borrow money to send their children to school, they're going to make their payments to send their baby child to school. Yeah. So they might miss the rent. They might miss the light bill for a month. You know how you do it, and you pick up catch they ain't going to miss the cable bill, though. Uh, no. <laughs> Neither the cable bill nor the... Nor, nor the uh, you know, the student, you know, loan. Right. So, you know, th these laws that seemingly are race neutral have a racial impact. Right. And that becomes the issue when you look at uh, what's happening with the Department of Education. Now, Clinton put something into effect, which was horrible, that if you had had any involvement with the criminal justice system, you couldn't get a student loan. But they never enforced it. Now, suddenly, under Bush, they started enforcing it. Right. So you, you know, you're minding your business standing on a corner, which I realize that that's a stereotype, but you know, some folks do that. Right. And the popo come by and they arrest everybody. You haven't done anything. Mm -hmm. Or the marijuana. Uh, now, white people smoke marijuana at the same rate that black people do. Yeah. But black people have six times the number of arrests for smoking marijuana. But this is post-racial America. Yeah, but why is that? Because black folks smoke their marijuana outside. White folks smoke their marijuana in the country club or inside, so you're not going to bust into the country club and say, let me see your pot. Whereas if you're outside, you know, you just go for it. Let's come back locally for a moment. You had harsh criticism for Michelle Reed. Mm -hmm. She's a very polarizing figure while she was here in Washington, D.C. She had her def defenders. She had her detractors, uh, Mayor Fenty, um, who was no longer the mayor. Um, Praise the Lord. Was a, uh, was a big defender. Um, why you have such 
harsh criticism for Michelle Reed? First of all, she had contempt for the teachers uh, that were under her jurisdiction. She truly did have contempt for teachers. And we know that African-American women are more likely than others to be teachers. So to me, I took that personally. My mama was a teacher. My grandmother was a teacher. You do not tell black women in those tones. She, I mean, she had a superiority complex. Some of the things she did, I didn't think were that bad. Many of them were. But the whole issue, you come to Washington, D.C. with a broom in your hand and on the cover of Time magazine with a broom in your hand? Excuse me. Take that broomstick and ride it. But, you know, do not come. <laughs> you go clean house. I got you clean and I got your house. Yeah. Um, she um, and Fenty supported her almost, you know, unilaterally to the point that I'm so happy that, you know, she said she was part of the, the pa package. Absolutely. See you and him, too. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, basically, it's her, it's her attitude, um, the whole notion of union busting. We, again, we know what importance unions have been for our people. You understand, if you look at the history of Washington, D.C., the extent to which uh, segregation in the public schools was problematic. And in some of the schools, like Spingarn, historically, you had very few black teachers. Now, you know, those schools were the places, the repositories of a lot of black PhDs, because we weren't able to teach in colleges, so we were teaching in the high schools, but even at that level, you had some folks who couldn't get jobs because other folks were teaching our kids. And you know what happens when other folks teach our kids. All too often, they don't believe in our kids. All our kids need is for someone to say, I believe in you, you can do it. To take them by the hand and say, this is what you need to do. Ree was all about, um, you cannot hold a teacher responsible for a standardized test outcome. First of all, when standardized tests don't measure everything, but secondly, I come to school hungry. Yeah. You know, mama's on drugs. Again, I'm stereotyping. Or mama's not there because she's got two jobs going on. I come to school hungry, um, so I'm sleepy, yeah. so I don't learn anything. Now, you're going to tell the teacher it's your fault this child didn't eat breakfast? And I know a lot of folks who bring food. I know a lot of folks who bring books. But everybody's not. Teachers have families, too. So we basically went about this with an arrogance that is unmitigated. And then she turned her, I'm going to beat these white, black folks in D.C. into shape, into a national movement where she got millions of dollars to run through other cities with her broom in her hand. That's just, it's just absurdity. Uh, we need to have people to administer the system, but they need to have some humility. I mean, Kaya Henderson, pretty much current superintendent, has many of the same methods as Michelle Reed, but mm -hmm. she's a native Washingtonian, right. and she gets the culture. Yeah. Now, again, I wouldn't agree with her, but my response to her would not be as vehement. Right. We had a, um, Ebony Magazine a couple years ago did a roundtable on education. Reed was on it, and so was I, and the brother, um, the brother who has the academies up in... Um, in the New York, there were about four of us on the panel. Mm -hmm. And she started talking about how if anybody cared about education, they would support Mayor Fenty. Well, you know, it got so ugly that the lady at Ebony said, okay, we're just going to stop now. Because, you know, I called her ignorant, multisyllabically. Um, so, you know, I, I thought she was intellectually deficient. And you cannot tie a mayor to the school, the education. And she, you know, she said, well, anybody who cares about education, I said, how dare you? Are you going to tell me, college president, that I don't care about education? I said, no, I don't care about Mayor Fenty. And you know you're going to have Cora on uh, later in your show. But what he did to Cora Berry was criminal. It was nothing more than criminal. And then he refused to meet with Maya Angelou. What right. is wrong with that boy? Yeah. You know? And then, you know, he went over to Reverend Willie Wilson at Union Temple. Reverend Wilson was talking about discrimination. He said, what about the discrimination that white people feel? Yeah. You know, I mean, it's the train doesn't go all the way to the station. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back with this shrinking violet, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Julianne Malvo, in just a moment. Pohanka Nissan and Pohanka Hyundai. It's hard to be down on your luck when you're Virginia's first choice for new Nissan and Hyundais, but I need to sell 60 cars this week. Right now, I'll pay you big bucks for your good luck. Bring down any good luck charm you've gotten based on the sale price of the car you choose. I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car this week. Today, your lucky penny is worth plenty, up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car you want. Stop moping and hoping you'll get approved. 
With my For the People credit approval process, the banks are looking to get lucky and lend to you, even if you've been turned down before. Bring me any good luck charm and I'll give you up to $4,777 off any nicer, newer car today. Hurry, once I get rid of 60 cars, the luck runs out. All offers require bank approval, so call us at 1-800-POANCA, visit Poanca Nissan and Poanca Hyundai on Route 1 in Fredericksburg, or better yet, log on to timpoankaforthepeople.com. And when we make a deal, I promise it'll be your lucky day. I'm Tim Poanka, and I'm a leprechaun for the people. Welcome back to the Rock Newman Show. We are broadcasting from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Ports, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. This will be our final segment this hour with Dr. Julianne Malvo, the highly accomplished Dr. Julianne Malvo. Um, we uh, just wrapped up that last segment talking a little bit about Washington, D.C. and uh, the school system here and its leader at one point, uh, who was a bit of a polarizing figure. Um, Dr. Malvo, you were president for five years at Bennett College. Mm -hmm. As I remember it, prior to your going there, Bennett was really struggling and it seemed as if it was barely, Bennett College was barely on life support. You had a thriving career here in the Washington DC area. Um, you were oftentimes um, a, a, a pundit on many news shows and highly sought after. Why did you take that job? How did they get you to take that job? Well, you know, my predecessor was Dr. Janetta Cole, who's the only woman who's led both Spelman and Bennett. So the two HBCUs for women, she's led both of them. Right. And um, as I always say about the college, Janetta Cole got us out of the emergency room, and my job was to get us out of the hospital. Uh -huh. uh, the school was doing very poorly. Uh, enrollment was down. We were able to get enrollment up. I had historic enrollment um, in 2009 academic year of over 700 students. It was like 750, which was just amazing when um, in 2004, the enrollment was like 400. So we were able to literally bring fo more folk in. I was able to build four buildings in four years, um, which again was just amazing, unprecedented, and the first new construction in 28 years. What I saw is that it was something that I could do. Mm -hmm. I knew going in that I would be a square peg in a round hole. I am clearly not your basic college president. Yeah. Um, my mouth is too blunt. You know, um, I say what I think. And the job requires quite a bit of diplomacy. You're not supposed to say what you think. What do you think, what do you think in your background best prepared you to become president at Bennett? Being an economist. I mean, I was able to restructure the finances of the college because I understood that. So I think more than anything else, the fact that I'm an economist. Also, the fact that I've been an educator one way or another most of my life. I've spoken at over 500 colleges. Although I've had appointments at Michigan State University, I was a visiting professor, did some teaching at Howard University. So basically understanding the continuum of the system. But I think the most important thing is that I was an economist. We owed the federal government like $8 million, but they were charging us 8% interest in 2007. So what I was able to do, and they kept telling me it had never been done before, what I was able to do was to restructure, basically to refinance the debt. Mm -hmm. Now, the federal government, with their trifling sales, charged us a $1 million prepayment penalty, which was ridiculous. However, we paid it, and that's how we got the money for the buildings. Because when we, had, when we uh, restructured, we had to do all the survey work and all of that, so then we didn't have to come back and do that again. And that was, I didn't plan that, that was just a lucky accident. Okay. But uh, in any case, what you see, the federal, it's in the federal government's interest, I believe, to support our HBCUs and to grow them. But instead, they're telling you that we've never done this before. And I thought, well, you know what? If black folks did what we always did, we'd still be picking cotton. Yeah. You know, so we don't do that anymore either. Right. So try something different. And hip hop, uh, Brother Kimbrough at Philander, the, the um, sister that I used to help with the restructuring, mm -hmm. brilliant MBA from uh, Warden, essentially ended up having a minor career in doing this for other colleges. Uh -huh. Once they saw that we could do it, then they said, okay, if Malvo can do it, so can we. Right. So, we, you know, it, it was an amazing experience. And what was also amazing was the pushback. Um, not only um, at the Department of Education, but even among some on my team. And my, my CFO ended up leaving over it, which was fine with me. Uh -huh. um, because I had to tell him one day, I said, I hate to be uh, overbearing, but you need to look at the bottom of your check the next time you decide to mess with me. See whose signature was on? Mm -hmm. 
because he basically <laughs> op he opposed the uh, ex expansion, mm -hmm. and he said it was. It, see, but that's us again. We, as Carter G. Woodson said, you know, if there was no back door in the house, we would go build one. You know, so we could go in the back door. Talking about us again, this has been a news-filled week, and oh, I yeah. want to try to squeeze in a lot from the week. But 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 you're saying about your uh, quoting Carter G. Woodson. Trayvon Martin trial mm -hmm. and his friend yes. on the witness stand mm -hmm. who may have this week come under as much ridicule and you know you anticipate and you expect it from folks who don't look like her, pundits, mm -hmm. bigots, yep. racists, you kind of expect that it would come. Mm -hmm. But the vitriol that has been uh, thrown her way from other African Americans has been nauseating. I agree. You know, I looked at that young sister. She's 19 years old. She's from Haiti. She speaks four languages. So if she speaks four languages and she happens to, you know, muffle on the English from time to time, that should be understandable. Yeah. She. Um, the collision that I saw was that tall, angular white man who kept pushing her. And you've got this um, kind of short, kind of plump sister. They were in two different worlds. They yeah. were literally in two different worlds, and their appearances uh, emphasized that. I thought she looked fine, uh, but I, you know, we are harder on each other than we are on anyone else. Why? Self-hate. So, and, and basically, inbred self-hate. So you look at, for example, I was with a sister just the other day. Red and orange are my favorite colors. And she said, I would never wear a red dress. And I said, why not? She said, well, my mom told me. I'm like, how old are you? Your mom told you. A bazillion years ago, you know, back in the day, we weren't supposed to wear bright colors. And the darker you were, you weren't supposed to wear bright colors. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, we have the whole rainbow. Why not wear bright colors? But this woman had so institutionalized that that she actually said to me, I don't understand why you're always wearing red. You stick out in the crowd. I said, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You uh, know, we're, I, I'm going to come back to that in the next segment when both you and uh, Core Masters Barry are here. You talk about self-hate. I posted um, a relatively immature, uh, made a relatively immature post on Facebook this week where I call Clarence Thomas, in addition to Uncle Tom, and Uncle Tom, a whole bunch of other names, and I said that he was self-hating. He is. Talk this to us a, about Clarence Thomas. This is a man who said, were it not for affirmative action, he would not have been able to go to Yale University Law School. So basically, you walk through the door, now you're gonna slam it in my face? Right. I don't think so. He has a, they used to call him when he was a kid, ABC, stand for American uh, Blackest Child. I'm, okay, I thought, what, because that, that, that was a, that, that was when you did some name calling back in the day, oh, yeah. in the 50s and the 60s, ABC was a real insult for a dark-skinned person because it, where, where, how I understood it in, out in Brandywine, Maryland, was Africa's blackest child. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then the, on the flip side, you know, people want to talk about skin color, but we, uh, paler black people, got mm -hmm. our share of insults too. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll never forget um, this. When I was in high school, this guy called me. You know what color? You know what? We're gonna come back to that. We're gonna come back to that. But talk. Let's talk a little bit more about Clarence Thompson he and and the decisions. Yes. that the Supreme Court rendered this week? Well, the affirmative action decision um, is a setback for us, although it's a temporary setback in that it went back to the lower court. So it depends on what the lower court decides. But you can see the death knell of affirmative action, the writing on the wall, starting with Bakke in 1978 and going through any number of cases, looking at the Greta case, University of Michigan. I don't know where they find these little average white women. I mean, these women are average. Yeah. And then they're asserting that they are entitled to go to the University of Michigan or the University of Texas. In Texas, the top 10% are automatically admitted. So this young lady clearly was not in the top 10%. Um, in fact, you know, maybe she was in the top 25%, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, this, this, again, this is white arrogance. I deserve, I'm entitled to go to this school. No, you're not. I mean, admissions is not a, a science, it's an art. 
You know, it's not, let's add up your SAT scores and your grades. Yeah. You're also looking at extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. You're also looking at what you bring to the table. But in any case, I mean, because I'm struck by the averageness of these young women. Um, the Gretter woman from University of Michigan, and there was another, just the arrogance. But in any case, we had a severe Delta setback, and Clarence Thomas said that he would overturn Grutter, which was the case that forced admissions officers to use race as one of several factors. Right. So you could not be admitted because you were black. Mm -hmm. You could be admitted because, among other things, you were black. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Grutter is fair, as far as I'm concerned, many of our inner city schools don't have international baccalaureate. Many of our inner city schools do not have uh, advanced placement. So you get extra points for international baccalaureate or advanced placement. So if you're from Detroit and you didn't have IB, you're already missing two points against somebody who's from the suburbs. So that's one way of making up for that. So, you know, many of our inner city schools are in horrible trouble. Some of them have gone bankrupt. They had to appoint a monitor for the Detroit schools. Well, now Detroit is just under occupation. Not only a monitor for the schools, but the mayor this governor has appointed a special monitor for the city. So basically now people in Detroit have no self-determination. But so, so I think Greta was a fair decision, but I, now you want a good laugh um, with the gay rights. There's a piece in today's Washington Post, not a piece, a cartoon. So it's two gay brothers and the guy said, well, I guess we can get married, but we can't vote. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, right. because the Voting Rights Act reversal is a serious problem. I was in Shelby County in February, and the mayor of Birmingham came out, and a few other people came out to hear me speak, and we were talking, the mayor and I were talking at length about what happened. There was a brother, one black man, on the Shelby County Commission. One black man. So they gerrymandered that one black man out of his seat. And because they were supposed to check with the Justice Department before they did it, that's how the lawsuit came about. The Justice Department came in and made them give the man his seat back. And so, this is what they're saying, we need to have self-determination, but the reason why you're under Justice Department supervision is because you have been discriminating in the past. That's why they're there. We had grandfather clauses as recently as 1965. My, gra my great aunt, the one who beat me, um, she was a registrar of voters, of the, the black registrar of voters. They changed the rules, literally, every election cycle. So one time you had to read the Constitution, one time you had to learn yeah. parts of the Constitution in Latin. Uh, she was very persistent, and she, every time you turned around. And this lady, on her birth certificate, uh, illiterate white person, clearly illiterate, her race was collared, like the Greens. Collard. They couldn't even spell colored. Mm. Collared. Race, collared. We used to mess with it. We're like, okay, collard. Can I get a little, kind of little vinegar with that collard? <laughs> you know. But um, this lets you know what was going on in Mississippi. Black mm -hmm. teachers earning less than white teachers as recently as 1969, which is why so many black women in the summers would go to UCLA or somewhere, get their little six credits so they could get a little more money. Mm -hmm. So um, it, the Voting Rights Act is important, and we still need it. Okay. I, I am intentionally, specifically, Focusing somewhat here on Clarence Thomas because he is an African, and he's from the South. Because he's the African American from the South, so he knows better. And he is carrying the water mm -hmm. of the worst of the of, of those who would oppress. And I just want to see if you what further thoughts you have about him in particular and why this man behaves the way that he behaves. Again, I think it's as, as self-hate. He had a black wife who apparently, I mean, I don't, I'm not repeating rumors, but there are some unsavory uh, rumors about how he treated his black wife. Then he married the linebacker. So I guess she, he's not gonna treat her but so bad because she could probably stomp him. But um, somewhere, and, and somewhere, some, some, somewhere in the midst of all of this was Anita Hill. Yes. And I remember, I, I remember my mother was in the hospital when those trials were going on, mm -hmm. the Nita Hill trials were going on. And I remember sitting there watching, and, you know, my, my mother was quite ill at the time, so nothing, so I was really focused on it. And I just remember always believing Anita Hill and knowing that he was a liar. Well, you know, there were eight, not, not eight, there were a number of other women who had similar allegations. One was not allowed 
on one of the panels to testify. Um, she had literally the same experience as Anita Hill did. Um, what kind of man sexually harasses people, especially in Washington, D.C.? Right. You don't have to sexually harass anybody in Washington, D.C. I right. mean, unless you have real issues, mm -hmm. because the sisters are there. You know, unfortunately, some of them don't need to be, but that's another story. Clarence Thomas hated himself, and he had contempt for black women, and the only thing I could think is what was his relationship with his mom. But remember, his mom sent him to live with the grandfather because his mom was, she, I mean, her job was crab picking. And picking crabs is ugly work yeah. and it doesn't pay very much. So she sent him, now I wonder if he had some conflicts around that. His mom was on public assistance and his sister. And here you have the Supreme Court justice who's not helping them. You know, I mean, again, there's something wrong with him. I would love to see, every time I see him, I wish I had a degree in psychology. Yeah. Because, or in psychiatry, really. Because this is some deep stuff. I mean, it's almost like you want to give him, they have antidepressants. You want to give him anti-racist pills. Him, the yeah. black man. You know, I mean, he, to, to, in my estimation, he has emerged as perhaps the biggest Judas ever in the African-American community. And you know, Rock, it's okay to be black and conservative. Absolutely. Although I don't, I don't know how anybody does it, but it's okay to be black and conservative. Mm -hmm. But to be black and self-hating, to tell people that affirmative action will make you feel inferior about yourself? Right. Mm -mm. right. Affirmative action opens the door. You still have to get out. You know, I'm affirmative action admit to MIT, and I'm not ashamed. Yeah. They were looking for black people. They found one. Yeah. They found a few of us, and we finished. Half of us finished. Our completion rate, you know, with a lot of PhDs, a lot of people don't finish because it's just a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but anyway, our completion rate was equal to the completion rate of our white counterparts. A lot of people just didn't finish. And so for anyone to say affirmative action um, essentially hurts you. No, it doesn't. It helps you. I mean, I graduated magna, not thankful, but also not kuma. Mm -hmm. You know, I SUMA, and I didn't graduate SUMA because I had too much fun yeah. and because I was too much of a political activist. Folks, you know, my professors were like, if you would just put your mind to this, you could graduate SUMA. I said, well, if the trade-off is graduating magna and having some fun, uh -huh. I'm going to graduate have magna. Little, have a little bit I am fun. not going to be but so much of a nerd. We're um, going to keep you here and have some fun in the next hour. Right now, we've got to wrap this segment up, go to a break, and we'll be back. Uh, Dr. Julianne Melbo will stay with us and be joined by Cora Masters-Wiles, former First Lady of the Barry. District of Columbia. Now, Cora Masters-Wiles.